What is the Falcons' offensive potential this upcoming season? And will pre-snap motion help the team reach their true ceiling? You are Locked On Falcons, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back, everyone, to another illustrious episode of the Locked On Falcons podcast, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast, part of Locked On Sports Atlanta, your team every day. And today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On to get started. So, guys, if you don't know me, I'm your very humble host, Aaron Freeman, a.k.a. Mr. Drew, a.k.a. Sirius Black, a.k.a. the Jolly Green Giant, a.k.a. the Iron that sharpens the iron, a.k.a. Mr. A.k.a. And, of course, I've been covering the Falcons for 18 years, formerly at Falcons.com, RIP, still going strong on this illustrious podcast. And I think each and every one of you that goes strong with me as everydayers of this illustrious podcast that makes it your first listen or first watch each and every day and all you got to do to become an everyday or subscriber follow for free on youtube or wherever you listen to podcasts so today's episode we're talking all about the offense's potential we'll talk a little bit later about how motion could potentially raise the ceiling for what this offensive output could be in 2024 under year one of zach robinson we'll talk later about why drake london is kind of the biggest breakout candidate not only on the offense but on the team in its entirety but let's start by talking about the offensive potential of this team. And I know that over the last week or two, we've been too negative, according to, to, to many of you guys out there, because we've been talking primarily about the defense. And last week, we spent a lot of time talking about the breakout potential of several defensive players. And, you know, I'll admit, like, i not particularly high on this defense. I think probably their ceiling is probably a league average defense. Best case scenario this year, I kind of expect them to be a below average defense, probably in the 20s. When all is said and done, when, the, when we're looking at some of the more advanced metrics rather than just yards and uh, points allowed that a lot of people tend to cherry pick whenever it suits them to say, oh, we have a top 10 defense. It's like, oh, OK, but, you know, I think the opposite is true for the offense, right? Like there is a lot more potential for this offense to kind of carry their success. And throughout the last couple of weeks, we've been talking quite a bit about while we're not particularly high on this defense in large part due to the lack of uh, proven pass rushers uh, outside of, you know, Grady Jarrett and David Onyemata. Um, you know, the, the potential for this offense is much, much higher. And really the success of the Falcons in 2024, I think will stem heavily from their offense just because I don't think the defense is going to be at a level where they can be consistent, uh, consistently competitive, especially given that you're probably going to be facing much better quarterbacks this year than you were a year ago. And so therefore not having the pass rush is going to matter. That's where all that comes from. But yeah, you know, I think this offense has the potential to be, you know, their floor is probably a top 15 unit that should be their floor. I mean, certainly possible that they could not perform up to those expectations, but uh, I think, you know, all things being equal, their floor should be like a top 15 type of offense. And, you know, this is based off purely off my gut feeling. This is no scientific data to back this up. Maybe as we get close to the start of training camp or the season, we might have some more data to back this up. But purely just looking at, you know, last year's offenses and how those offenses stacked up in terms of like expected points that you can find over at profootballreference.com. And just like gut feeling on what do I think the Falcons offense is going to look like in comparison to what some of those offenses look like. I feel like their gut feeling, my gut feeling is like they'll probably be in that 12 to 14 range. That's where teams like Tampa Bay, New Orleans and Houston were last year from an expected points total. Uh, I think their potential is greater than that, though. Like there is certainly a potential that this Falcons offense can be a top 10 unit, top eight sort of unit. Uh, if all things come together for them. But that's partially why, like, I'm not as sold as maybe other people are, just because, like, I think a lot of people look at this group of skilled players looking at the quarterback, the running back, the wide receiver, the tight end, and sort of su suggest that they're, like, already an elite unit when they haven't necessarily proven that, right? And, like, this year is kind of the year where you can get the opportunity to sort of prove that. And, up to the, like, while I think the Falcons' skill players are good, like I think they're very good. I want to make that clear. 
I think they're a, a, a tad bit overrated to a certain extent because I think a lot of people are basing it purely off of potential that we just haven't quite seen it yet with this unit. And that's part of the reason why like, I'm not quite ready to declare them a top 10 unit, even though I think they have the capacity to be that. And when we talk about what they could be, you know, they, they have the potential to be a top 10 offense. And, and again, based off of expected points from last year, like, you know, I, I see the potential there for them to be maybe in that seven, eight range where the Rams and dolphins were a year ago. And I think a lot of their ability to get that high, it's going to be based heavily off of their play call. Right. That I just don't think just the skill players alone are like, Oh, that's guarantee that they're going to get to that level. Right. A top 10 sort of unit. Um, that I think if they're going to be a top 10 unit, it's going to be because of Zach Robinson, their new offensive coordinator, is as good as advertised as one of the top up and coming young play callers in the NFL that is worthy of the, the hype and excite, excitement um, that he has gotten over the last couple of months because he was one of the hottest candidates in this coaching cycle. We've seen a lot of McVay disciples from LA over the years go on to be very successful head coaches and play callers. Throughout the league, Kevin O'Connell, Zach Taylor, among others. Uh, and the expectation is Zach Robinson is going to be the next one. And because he's unproven at this point, it's hard for me at this point to just because, you know, after six years of the Falcons basically supposedly being a good team, but like not living up to those expectations, like at year seven is like that's basically what people don't understand is like, even though I understand why a lot more people are excited about the potential now in year seven, I'm just like, well, they have failed to live up to their expectations for six straight years. So what are the odds that they're going to do it in year seven for me at this point in time? And that's why the root of my skepticism is like, you know, fool me once, you know, shame on, you know, the, the point is I can't get fooled again. But you, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's just like, fool me six times. It's like, all right, like I, you can't fool me the seventh time, right? Uh, that's that's kind of where I'm at with the Falcons. And so it's a more of a wait and see mode for me just because, the wool has been pulled over my eyes far too many times over the last couple of years. But all that to say is I, I do really think Zach Robinson um, has the potential to really take this, uh, you know, a simple talent that the Falcons have and, and take it to a, a brand new level to a level we haven't seen in, in quite some time. It's been basically five years since the Falcons have had a top 10 ish offense going back to that 2018 uh, season uh, where, where Sark seemed to figure things out. And unfortunately the rest of the team, wasn't able to figure the rest of the stuff out in order for the team to win then. And, it, you know, that season feels so long ago where it's like, oh, yeah, they'll bounce back in 2019. Of course they'll bounce back in 2019. And then they didn't. But all that to say, guys, sorry for going on a train. <laughs> Bringing up all these feelings. But, like, I do think for Zach Robinson to really unlock the full potential of this offense, I do think pre-snap motion may – be the the key critical ingredient that's going to allow this offense to reach a higher ceiling than at least currently I'm projecting it. And I'm sure some of you guys else out elsewhere out there are also projecting it to be a true blue top 10, top eight type of offense. And we'll break that down on why motion could be the key ingredient for this offense as we continue today's Locked on Falcons. But guys, it is summertime, which means baseball, the NBA Finals, and so much more. And you can bet on it all over at FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Because right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $200. You can use the bet on everything from the NBA Finals MVP, Stanley Cup Finals MVP, or who's going to hit one out of the park. Or you can bet on, you know, the Falcons win totals, nine and a half over under. You want to bet on their Super Bowl odds? By all means, you want to bet on Kirk Cousins, how many yards he's going to throw to uh, throw for in this uh, new look Zach Robinson offense. You know, 4,000, 4,500 yards, 30 touchdowns, 40 touchdowns, more. It's all available for you over at fanduel.com slash locked on, and you can add a big win to your summer bucket list. So just visit fanduel.com slash locked on. Fanduel is America's number one sports book. So before we continue today, I want to tell you guys about Locked On Sports Today, a free 24-7 streaming channel uh, program for you every day to bring you the biggest stories, the can't-miss analysis, opinions, news, streaming 24-7 on YouTube, or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app. And of course, if you're looking for the more local stories, those big stories and can't-miss analysis, check out Locked On Sports Atlanta on f for free on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app. It's all part of Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. 
So I really do think motion can really elevate this offense beyond what my current expectations are. And that's part of it where it's like, we don't know what Zach Robinson is going to bring to the table. We can make educated guesses, but like the education is not great because he hasn't really been a play caller outside of like two preseason games um, over the last couple of years. Uh, and, you know, in the preseason, like teams are calling extremely vanilla stuff. So you can't really glean anything off of that. Uh, so we're really just making very uneducated guesses about Zach Robinson, but we're just kind of looking at the tendencies from, you know, what Kevin O'Connell, Zach Taylor, you know, they took from those Rams offenses to their current destinations, as well as looking at Sean McVay and, and sort of the evolution of the Rams offense. And we'll probably have some guests uh, over the course of the summer that will be able to provide a little bit more insight into that than I can, just because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a so-called expert. Uh, on the Atlanta Falcons and emphasize the air quotes on the expert uh, part of it very much. So, uh, <laughs> but you know, you know, my area of expertise, if you can call it that, uh, which you, you shouldn't uh, is the Atlanta Falcons. And of course other people are, are you know, we, we defer to other people that watch these other teams for a living. We've had Luke Braun on of locked on Vikings sort of touching upon some of the hallmarks of the Kevin O'Connell scheme that he ported over from, LA when he left there as well on the podcast. So go check that out. But we'll probably have more of those conversations over the course of summer is basically the point I want to make. But, you know, motion, I think, is is something that's kind of taken the league by storm the last couple of years with what Mike McDaniel, another Shanahan McVay disciple, uh, has, has done in Miami these last couple of years. And there's generally two types of pre-snap motion. I think the first type is usually the type that you see in the NFL, um, which is, I think, the same type of pre-snap motion that we saw here in Atlanta last year. Uh, and have primarily seen in the past here in Atlanta, which is the more common way of utilizing motion, which is meant to give the quarterback more information pre-snap, right? That you'll send a receiver in motion, and usually it's meant to sort of glean, are the, is the defense in zone or are they, are they in man coverage, right? And usually that's determined by if a guy will follow that motion receiver. That usually is a very strong indicator that the team is about to play man, uh, and if the, no one follows that guy, it's a very strong indicator that the team can – to play zone and you know that's not a hundred percent but like 90 percent of the time it's generally accurate now the second way i think is really where miami has sort of re-revolutionized the league right it's not to say that they invented this but they've certainly taken the league by storm with their offensive output these last couple of years uh with Tua tonga Bailoa and tyree kill and jalen waddle and it's using motion to try to basically break the rules of defense and create mismatches uh trying to use leverage against them right and so you know, the, the simplest way I can explain this is like, depending on what coverage defenses and, and what they're doing in terms of their coverage shells, there are certain rules, right, that are dependent on where receivers line up, you know, they're, they're outside, inside, in the slot, all this various stuff. If it's a three by one set, it's a two by two set, whatever it is, in terms of the receivers lining up on either side of the, you know, the, the ball. Um, and, you know, depending on the alignment, depending on what releases those receivers have, if they have a vertical release, if they break inside, they break outside, right? That will generally determine there are rules that defenses live by that will basically operate off of that. And what that pre-snap motion that the Dolphins have done and teams like the Rams and other, especially disciples of the uh, McVay Shanahan coaching tree, sort of being like, oh, the student has become the master in, in terms of Mike McDaniel. Like, we're going to reincorporate some of this stuff that they're doing back into our offense and the Rams, uh, I, I think took advantage of this quite a bit last year with their use of the preset motion. Um, it's it's basically meant to cr break the rules of the defense of the coverage shows. Like, oh, you know, we know that this guy's going to pick up this guy. If we run this route, so we're going to try to break that by motioning this guy. And so then there's going to be confusion. It creates miscommunication, right? That defenses have to plan for ahead of time because in the moment it's going to be hard to communicate okay we're adjusting to this guy this guy's moving here i got this guy you got this guy and we're changing on the fly based off of that pre-snap motion which changes the alignment of some of these receivers before the snap right like where a guy goes from inside to outside or outside to inside or goes from you know inside on this side to outside on the opposite side of the field and that creates these opportunities for breakdowns and, and, and coverages and miscommunications. And that's really what it does. And it, you know, the dolphins have been able to exploit that because of the speed that they have. And when I look at the Falcons, you know, I've expressed not necessarily the, the, the greatest degree of confidence in their non Drake London receivers. Right. And we'll talk more about Drake London later in the episode, but let's talk about the Darnell Mooney's and the Rondo Moore's right now. 
because usually at the end of the day, like I, I tend to think, you know, I, I look at wide receivers as like, you know, it's third and seven, do or die, fourth quarter, whatever. We need this third down conversion in order to, you know, keep the game going and, and potentially win the game. You know, I need my guys to be able to get open. And, you know, ultimately at the end of the day, I think this is kind of the true litmus test of who the best receivers are, who's the guy that you can trust in those situations to get open on, on that third and seven in the fourth quarter. And Mooney and Darnell Mooney and Rondell Moore are not the guys that traditionally I think are those types of guys that can win in those situations that you look at their production the last couple of years in both uh, Chicago and Arizona, you know, and you compare that to someone like Alameda Zacchaeus and his production in his last two years in Atlanta and Zacchaeus' production is actually better than both of those guys. Just looking at, you know, volume stats, looking at deep, you know, targets and his efficiency on those plays as well as contested catch. And that's why you've heard me in the past sort of suggest that Mooney and Moore and these guys are, really kind of number three ish wide receivers as opposed to the number two types of guys a high caliber number two type of receiver that you ideally would want and why i don't necessarily look at them as an upgrade over what the falcons had at wide receiver last year just a different type of similar skill set of what the falcons had last year but i do think the thing that mooney and moore both do bring to the table is that speed element and I don't necessarily think that has translated particularly well for them in Chicago and Arizona, respectively, as these playmakers. But that's where, to me, the Zach Robinson of it all comes into, and especially with the motion, that he can kind of borrow a little bit from what Miami does and allow those guys in Mooney and Moore to be more effective than what they have been in a, quote unquote, more traditional uh, offensive attack. And by utilizing the motion to create these sort of mismatches for these guys that their speed can now take advantage in the leverage and all those various things, those players could be better than what I perceive them to be, which is, you know, okay, complimentary receivers, but aren't guys that are really going to move the needle for your offense in a major way. And that's where I think the growth potential for this offense to be better than what I'm thinking it is, which is kind of based heavily off of, which we'll talk about in a second, sort of Drake London being this sort of breadwinner and being the guy that carries your offense. And then you get sporadic, you know, moments from Mooney and Moore, like that to me only that has a tends to have a lower ceiling to me in terms of my perception. That's why I think it's more of a 12 to 14 range type of offense if that clicks. But where I think they can get more out of that and raise that ceiling to be that legit top 10 offense is if Zach Robinson has a great handle on motion and using motion to create the mismatches in the ways that other teams like the Rams, like the Dolphins, et cetera, have done so effectively in recent years. So that I think is something that we will continue to explore as the summer goes on. And we'll probably, you know, reach out and, and get some people on here. Uh, hopefully that have a little bit more insight. We're reaching that dead time of the summer where a lot of people that do football content are sort of taking their break. So we'll see uh, if they're available throughout the month of June, or if that's something that we won't necessarily get into until July and August when many of those people are getting back to work uh, to the to grind as it were. But, you know, someone who is definitely on his grind, I'm trying my best to come up with these great segues, guys, uh, is Drake London, right? And, you know, we talk about breakout potential. Like if there's one player that's going to have a breakout year uh, for the Falcons, the best bet I think is Drake London and we'll break down exactly why that is and why he is so poised to be this breakout candidate and breadwinner for this offense uh, moving forward. And we'll break that down to wrap up today's Locked on Falcons. So later this week, guys, we'll be joined by Alan Sterk and several other guests for the first two rounds of the Falcons historian shootout. Um, if you're interested in what that's all about, a trivia contest where we break down different players. First up, I believe, is Devontae Freeman with a matchup between our, our our fan favorites, Jarvis Davis and Corey Woodruff. And they'll answer trivia questions about Devontae Freeman. And whoever wins goes on to the next round and all that stuff. And then Alan and Matt Chernoff are talking about somebody. I can't I forgot who it is, but I will be reminded of it later this week when we have to record it. But um that's in store for you, you know, throughout the rest of the week. So look forward to that. But today we're wrapping up talking about Drake London and how Drake London kind of needs to be the guy. We've talked about this before on the podcast. He needs to be the guy. He needs to be the breadwinner. He needs to be that type of guy, that true new blue number one. And we've had various guests come on here like Derek Klassen over the last couple of months and express why they, he's very high on Drake London. Um, I like Drake London. I think he's been good up to this point. I don't think he's been quite good enough for me to feel super confident that he's definitely going to be the top 10 receiver but like if he can't be that guy in this offense then 
you know, it's, it's kind of going to be the, the definitive nail in the coffin that, hey, Drake London is a good receiver, but he's not on that level. Because even though I think you can certainly make the case that 2025, he should be even better than he, what he is in 2024. I think the, the case is, is pretty easy to make that he is the biggest breakout candidate of this entire Falcons roster. And if this offense is good, it's going to be by and large because Drake London is good. Uh, and one of the better wide receivers, or at least this offense is able to allow him to produce like one of the better wide receivers, because that's something that you've seen regularly in the McVay offense and, and many of his disciples offense, where there's, you know, that number one wide receiver. And while I don't think, you know, when you look at Justin Jefferson with Kevin O'Connell in Minnesota or Jamar Chase with Zach Taylor in, in Cincinnati, I don't put Drake on that level. Um, I certainly think he should theoretically be good enough to be put on the same level as a Cooper Cup or a Puka Nakua, both of whom weren't first round picked. Um, you know, and I think his skill set overlaps a lot more with those guys in terms of, you know, I know when Drake London was coming out, he was kind of hailed as like a prototypical X wide receiver, uh, which, and again, I thought at the time it was like he could be fine in that role, but I always thought his ceiling was greater as more of a big or power slot type of receiver more in mold with that Cooper cup role more in mold with that sort of Z possession receiver uh, like a Robert Woods, like a Puka Nakua type of guy uh, more so than that sort of, you know, Julio Jones, Jeff Justin Jefferson, Jamar chase level X that I typically associate with those high level X's uh, in that regard. And when you look at the Rams offense, like you look at the Shanahan offense, right? Historically, it's typically built around the X receiver. Brandon, I, currently, in San Francisco, Julio Jones here in Atlanta, Andre Johnson famously in, in Houston. And I remember having this conversation a couple of weeks ago where someone was basically asking me about X versus the Z. And it's like, you know, the X receiver being sort of the focus point of the offense has really only been a thing in the last 20 years, uh, as opposed to previously where the X was kind of a complimentary guy and the Z was more the possession guy, like Jerry Rice was a Z receiver. Um, I could use countless examples from the 80s and 90s, but we're not going to get into that. But you know, I, I do think the Rams offense, the point of that is the Rams offense typically builds their offense around the Z receiver. Like Robert Woods was getting more targets and more touches than Brandon Cooks was, who was the X receiver in those years, right? Uh, Cooper Cup has obviously been, you know, sort of the biggest breadwinner the last three, four years. And then you saw Puka Nakua play primarily that Z wide receiver role uh, this past year and be sort of the breadwinner. And that's part of the reason why we're like, you know, and we've already heard from Raheem Morris sort of indicating that Darnell Moon is going to be the X. He's going to be the Brandon Cooks. He's going to be the Van Jefferson, the 2-2 two -two Atwell in this offense. While Drake London, presumably, again, if Mooney's the X and who's going to be the Z, that's Drake London. And so it's telling us that, yeah, Drake London's going to be sort of the guy that this offense is funneled through. And that typically means, especially given, you know, our, you know, our, you know, mine, <laughs> lower expectations on what, Mooney and, and Moore will do as the the, the X and, and primary slot receiver. Um, you know, that means that, you know, London's going to have to get the line share targets, and that's going to be, you know, potentially 9, 10, 11 targets a game. We saw Cooper Cup, you know, hit that 11 target plus average in his triple crown year where he had over 200 targets that year uh, in 2021. You know, you look at Justin Jefferson as a great model. Like Justin Jefferson's averaged about 6.9 targets as a rookie in his first year in Minnesota, where him and Adam Thielen were kind of sharing the spotlight uh, as the go to options in that offense. And ever since then, he's averaged about 10 plus targets over the last three years. And meanwhile, Drake London's over the course of his two years in, in the NFL has averaged about 6.9 targets per game. So about seven targets a game. And, and so, like this year, we kind of need him to. <clears throat> essentially be on his Justin Jefferson game and elevate to being that potential 10 target uh, plus guy in order for this offense to work. And that's a, why I think Drake London has the breakout potential. I, you know, we're, we're talking about a season like we saw from Puka Nakua last year or Cooper Cup in the past or Robert Woods in the past, where we're looking at, you know, 160 plus potential targets uh, this upcoming season for someone like a Drake London. And if he can consistently show that again, not every week he's, is he going to put up, those types of numbers, but most weeks, like, you know, 12 
plus weeks, 75% of the time. If he can do that, that's going to be sort of the primary driving factor for this Falcons offense. So for that reason, that's why like we sit here and we say Drake London is the breakout candidate for this entire team. That if there's any player that you're going to bet on having this big year, this monster type of season, it should be Drake London, at least in the passing game. Like we're, we're still trying to figure out what Kyle Pitts is going to be. And then probably later this week, we'll talk a little bit more about Kyle Pitts and his potential to, to elevate this offense and his usage changing and how, what that could mean for his production. Of course, we've talked before about Bijan and what his value to this running game is going to be and how the run game is going to be a bigger part of this Falcons offense than what we've seen in recent years with the Rams or what we saw with Kirk Cousins in Minnesota in recent years on the Kevin O'Connell, where they just basically were just like, we're all pass first, you know? Uh, and I, you know, I think all the context clues tell you that that's not going to be the case here in Atlanta, at least this year, maybe in the future. But, you know, the Vikings went out there and, and you know, went out and used the first round pick on a, on a wide receiver in order to facilitate that type of offense because they knew Justin Jefferson and TJ Hawkinson couldn't do it alone. So they needed three good weapons. So that's why they brought in Jordan Addison this past year. And no offense to Darnell Mooney and Ronda Moore. I, again, I would love to be proven wrong on this. I think you need more than Drake London and, and uh, Kyle Pitts if the Falcons are going to be that type of offense that's going to throw the ball 40 plus times a game like Kirk Cousins has regularly done these last two seasons in Minnesota. So uh, that may be in store for the future of the Falcons, but right now we're going to get more of a balanced offense, but it's going to be sort of, you know, the three pillars of this offense are going to be Drake London, Kyle Pitts and, and B. John Robinson. And as we've discussed in previous years and throughout this off season, their success kind of hinges on their ability to make those guys reliable playmakers each and every week. Like we've seen flashes of, you know, we sprinkling of, of, of games here or there for Bijan and, and Kyle and, and Drake, you know, last year and previous years, but we need to see that consistently game in and game out, you know, eight plus 10 plus 12 plus types of games where those guys can put up steady production. I think that's to me, the root, if you're optimistic about the Falcons this year, uh, as many of you guys are and their ability to, you know, not disappoint me anymore and, and miss the playoffs for a seventh year in a row. You know, you're you're really betting on, on those three guys, those three top 10 picks and what Zach Robinson is going to do with them. And I think Drake London is, of course, the best bet just because of, you know, the passing game is going to be the, that tried and true. The run game, we'll see if they rebound, right? We've talked about that before. Kyle Pitts, we'll see if he rebounds coming off his injury season. But one thing that I think you can say with a great deal of confidence is that this passing attack is going to run through Drake London all the context clues suggest it. He's got the skill set to do it again. Uh, and we'll just sort of see if, if you know, him and Zach Robinson, along with Kirk Cousins, can get on the same page to maximize that skill set so that we see it week in and week out each and every week. And where no one is sitting here thinking Derek Klassen uh, is saying anything controversial, you know, a year from now or nine months from now when when people declare Drake London as a, as a top 10 wide receiver uh, without necessarily having the stats to back it up because this year he will have those stats to back it up. So that is what is in store for us uh, this upcoming season. We'll talk more about the offensive potential. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll be positive, you know, and, and, I mean, no, we're not going to be positive on this podcast. You, you guys know me, like, but we will, we will talk about the potential, right? Like, and then that's, you know, at least a more optimistic outlook, you know, whether <laughs> I, I will find some ways to undermine the positivity as we talk about it somehow, some way on this podcast, because I'm me. But, uh, you know, that's what's in store for you guys, you know, this week, as well as in the coming weeks, as well as the Falcons Historian Shootout. Make sure you check it out. Uh, continue to subscribe or follow for free on YouTube so you don't miss it or wherever you listen to podcasts. That is in store for you for your first listens. Throughout the week, for your second listen, check out Locked On Sports Today, Locked On Sports Atlanta, Locked On Braves, Locked On Bulldogs. You know, the NBA draft is right around the corner. Locked On Hawks, got you covered for what the Hawks are going to do with that number one pick. Alexander Saar, you know, Risa Shea, whatever his name is, I don't know. Uh, the other guys, I don't know. You know, that's why you check out Locked On Hawks to get that information rather than, you know, you don't come to Locked On Falcons for Hawks talk. Uh, so, that is what is else available here on Lockdown Sports Atlanta. It's all part of Lockdown Podcast Network, guys. Your team every day.